Do you remember Shook? Shook Avery? I do. Her father preached the Gospels of the Apostles. Shook taught her own gospel. To bless is to help. The blessed are the helped. And who is helped? Helped are those who are content to be themselves. They will never lack mystery in their lives and the joys of self-discovery will be constant. Helped are those who love the entire cosmos rather than their own tiny country, city, or farm. For to them will be shown the unbroken web of life and the meaning of infinity. Helped are those who live in quietness, knowing neither brand name nor fad. They shall live every day as if in eternity, and each moment shall be as full as it is long. Helped are those who love others unsplit off from their faults. To them will be given clarity of vision. Helped are those who create anything at all, for they shall relive the thrill of their own conception and realize a partnership in the creation of the universe that keeps them responsible and cheerful. Helped are those who love the earth, their mother, and who willingly suffer that she may not die. In their grief over her pain, they will weep rivers of blood and in their joy and her lively response to love, they will converse with trees. Helped are those whose every act is a prayer for harmony in the universe, for they are the restorers of balance to our planet. To them will be given the insight that every good act done anywhere in the cosmos welcomes the life of an animal or a child. Helped are those who risk themselves for others' sakes. To them will be given increasing opportunities for even greater risks. Theirs will be a vision of the world in which no one's gift is despised or lost. Helped are those who strive to give up their anger. Their reward will be that in any confrontation, their first thoughts will never be of violence or of war. Helped are those whose every act is a prayer for peace. On them depends the future of the world. Help to those who forgive. Their reward shall be forgiveness of every evil done to them. It will be in their power, therefore, to envision the new earth. Help to those who are shown the existence of the creator's magic in the universe. They shall experience delight and astonishment without ceasing. Helped are those who laugh with a pure heart. Theirs will be the company of the jolly righteous. <laughs> Helped are those who love all the colors of the human beings as they love all the colors of the animals and plants. None of their children, nor any of their ancestors, nor any parts of themselves shall be hidden from them. Helped are those who love the lesbian, the gay, and the straight, as they love the sun, the moon, and the stars. None of their children, nor any of their ancestors, nor any parts of themselves shall be hidden from them. Helped are those who love the broken, 
and the whole. None of their children, nor any of their ancestors, nor any parts of themselves shall be hidden from them. Helped are those who do not join mobs. There shall be the understanding that to attack in anger is to murder in confusion. Helped are those who find the courage to do at least one small thing each day to help the existence of another, plant, animal, river, or human being. They shall be joined by a multitude of the timid. Help to those who lose their fear of death. Theirs is the power to envision a future in a blade of grass. Helped are those who love actively and support the diversity of life. They shall be secure in their differences. Helped are those who know. Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I've walked like I've got oil webs pumping in my living room? just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders fallen like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard. Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. <laughs> you may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise? that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And if I listen, what do you think would happen? What do you think would happen if I listen, mama? Do you want me to grow old, sick of hating you? Do you think I want to hate you, mama? Do you think I want to keep lying? Because, yes, mama, I've been, I've been lying for some time now. I don't want to tell no more lies, mama. I don't, I don't want to keep having to feel bad that I have to go hide and go find something in those alleys you keep talking about. The alleys right outside this door to find something to help me hide from what I'm feeling. Mama, I want to be a man. It's time you let me be a man. It's time you let me go. If I, if I stayed, I'd be worse than daddy because I wouldn't be doing what I know I got to do. 
I've seen your life. I've seen daddy's life. And I, I I love you. I love you both. But I got my work to do. And it's somewhere out there in the world. And I got to go. And I know. I know you don't think I know what's going on. But I'm starting to see something every time I play. Every time I listen. I, I see daddy's face. I see your face. I see so many faces. And who's going to speak to that, mama? Who is gonna speak for us? I got to go. Maybe someday, one day, maybe someday I will be able to say something in music that's never been said before. Mama, you, you knew this day was coming. Alternate Names for Black Boys by Dinez Smith. One, smoke above the burning bush. Two, arch nemesis of summer night. Three, first son of soy. Four, coal awaiting spark and wind. Five, guilty until proven dead. Six, oil heavy starlight. Seven, monster until proven ghost. Eight, gone. Nine, Phoenix, who forgets to unash. Ten, going, going, gone. Eleven, gods of shovels and black veils. 12, what once passed for kindling. 13, fireworks at dawn. 14, brilliant shadow hued corral. 15, I thought to leave this blank, but who am I to aim to name us nothing? 16. Prayer, who learned to bite and sprint. 17. A mother's joy and clutched breath. There were once these five brothers, and they were all big and strong and handsome and didn't have a care in the world. One was known for his brain, so they called him Smarts. And one was known for his muscles, so they called him Tough Guy. The third one was a rascal, so they called him Wow. The fourth one was as good looking as all get out, and they called him Looker. And the fifth was the youngest, and he was called Honey Child because he was as young as he was sweet. And they was always together, these five brothers. Everywhere they went, they always went together. No matter what, they was always together because they was best friends and there wasn't nothing could divide them. 
And there was this princess. And she lived in a castle. And she was lonesome. She was lonesome and looking for love. And she couldn't leave her castle. So she couldn't look very far. So every day she would stick her head out her window and sing to the sun. And every night she would stick her head out and sing to the moon and the stars. Where are you? And one day the five brothers heard her and came calling. And she looked upon them and she said, there are five of you and each one is wonderful and special in his own way. But the law of my country doesn't allow a princess to have more than one husband. And that was such bad news. And they were all so in love. But they all cried. <laughs> Until the princess had an idea. She was, after all, the princess. So she changed the law of the land and married them all. With bro smarts, she had a baby named Jabba. And with bro tough guy, she had bully. With bro wild came trouble. With bro looker, she had beauty. With bro honey child came baby. And they was all happy. Cannery by Rita Duff. Billy Holiday's burned voice had as many shadows as lights, a mournful candelabra against a sleek piano, the gardenia her signature under that ruined face. Now you're cooking drummer to bass, magic spoon, magic needle, take all day if you have to with your mirror and your bracelet of song. Fact is, the invention of women under siege has been to sharpen love in the service of myth. If you can't be free, be a mystery. I was a junkie. A junkie. A dope addict. A Holly, a mainliner, a dope fiend. My arms and my legs to a full of holes. I got hooked about five years ago. See, I couldn't stand these chicks I was making it with. And I was working real hard at my music. And man, I was lonely. You come off a gig, you be tired. And you'd already taken as much shit as you could stand from the managers and the people in the room you'd been working. And you'd be off to make some down scene with some pasty-faced white bitch. And you'd make the scene. And somehow, you'd wake up in the morning and the chick would be beside you, alive and well, and dying to make the scene again. 
And somehow, you managed not to strangle her. You hadn't beaten her to death like you wanted to. And you get out of there. And you carry this pain around inside you all day and all night long. No way to beat it. No way. No matter how you turn, no matter what you did, no way. But when I started getting high, <laughs> I was cool. <sighs> it didn't bother me. And I wasn't lonely then. <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> and the chicks, I could handle them. They couldn't reach me. And I didn't know I was hooked until I was hooked. Then I started getting into trouble. I lost a lot of gigs. I had to sell my car. I lost my pad. And most of the chicks, they split naturally, but not all of them. Then I got busted. And I made that trip down to Lexington. And here I am, way down upon the Swanee River. But I'm gonna be all right. You can bet on it. The Black Family Pledge by Maya Angelou. Because we have forgotten our ancestors, our children no longer give us honor. Because we have lost the path our ancestors clear, kneeling in perilous undergrowth. Our children cannot find their way. Because we have banished the God of our ancestors, our children cannot pray. Because the long wails of our ancestors have faded beyond our hearing. Our children cannot hear us crying. Because we have abandoned our wisdom of mothering and fathering. Our befuddled children give birth to children they neither want nor understand. Because we have forgotten how to love, the adversary is within our gates and hold us up to the mirror of the world shouting, regard the loveless. Therefore, we pledge to bind ourselves again to one another, to embrace our lowliest, to keep company with our loneliest, to educate our illiterate, to feed our starving, to clothe our ragged, to do all good things, knowing that we are more than keepers of our brothers and sisters. We are our brothers and sisters. In honor of those who toiled and implored God with golden tongues, and in gratitude to the same God who brought us out of hopeless desolation, we make this. Pledge.
nobody see you, nobody hear you. You worked with people for 50 years and they still don't know your name. People push you out the way. All the time, you're screaming, you're screaming inside, but nobody come. You don't exist. How are you going to teach your children you don't exist? You've got to show them life hard. Mama never liked me. I was everything she never wanted to be. I was too black, my hair too dry. Everything that makes you invisible in the world. Oh, the try, I try. I could never do anything right for her. Even the last time I went home, everybody come around me, call me Miss English. Say they're proud of me, how smart I look. But now she, she never say a word to me. Right up to the end, she never said a word to me. They say, I don't see how they treat you. I see it, I see it, and it makes me want to tear the place down. I would chop off the hand if it would help you, dear. But I'm tired now. It's up to you. I want somebody to hold me now. I want to curl up in somebody's lap. I want someone to tell me stories that make the sun shine. And to gather, to gather me up and touch me cheek like I appraise and not a curse. And to stroke my hair like Mama never could. Juanda, Where Tears Have No Powers, by Haki R. Madubuti. Who has the moral high ground? 15 blocks from the White House on small corners in Northwest DC, boys disguised as me rip each other's hearts out with weapons made in China. They fight for territory. Across the planet, in a land where civilization was born, the boys of DC know nothing about their distant relatives in Rwanda. They have never heard of the Hutu or Tutsi people. Their eyes draw blanks at the mention of Kigali, Biumba, or Butare. And all they know are the streets of DC and do not cry at funerals anymore. Numbers and frequency have a way of making murder commonplace and not news, unless it spreads outside of our house, block, territory. Modern massacres are intra-ethnic. Bosnia, Sri Lanka, Burundi, Nagorno-Karabakh, Iraq, Laos, Angola, Liberia, and Rwanda are small foreign names on a map made in Europe when bodies by the tens of thousands float down a river, turning the water the color of blood, as a quarter of a million people flee barefoot into Tanzania and Zaire, somehow we notice. We do not smile. We have no more tears. We hold our thoughts. In deeply muted silence, looking south and thinking that today, Nelson Mandela seems much larger than he is. Common sense say, if you want to cut down on traffic, you gotta give the people an incentive. That's what the problem is now. People don't know how to think. You ever 
honk at somebody because they wasn't going fast enough. Where was they going? I know. I know where they was going. They was going to the next red light. <laughs> you ever think of that? Everybody's in a hurry to slow down. <laughs> it's kind of funny if you think about it. Mm. You get to be mayor. Is you going to be mayor of the black folks or the white folks? The white mayor. You be the mayor for the white folks. Black folks can't get the streets cleaned. The schools don't have no textbooks. Don't have no football uniforms. The mayor be the mayor for white folks. As soon as black folks get a club or something, the first thing they say is, can't just be for blacks. Why not? They got 500,000 things that be just for white folks. If you had 1,400 students out at Pitt eating lunch in the cafeteria and five black people eating lunch together, they say, look, see, they segregate themselves. They ain't said nothing about those 1,395 white folks eating lunch by themselves. What's wrong with being the mayor for black folks? In Another World by Razak Malik. In another world, I want to be a father without passing through the eternal insanity of mourning our children, without experiencing the ritual of watching my children return home as bodies folded like a prayer mat without spending my nights telling them the stories of a hometown where natives become aliens searching for a shelter. I want my children to spread a mat outside my house and play without the walls of houses ripped by rifles. I want to watch my children grow to recite the name of their homeland like Lord's Prayer, to frolic in the streets without being hunted like animals in the bush, without being mobbed to death. In another world, I want my children to tame grasshoppers in the field, to play with their dolls in the living room, to inhale the fragrance of flowers waving as wind blows to see the birds measure the sky with their wings. Do you think that I could? What if I could? What if I could ask the folks who call themselves white to come up here? Do you think they would? Could I ask them to come up in here so that we could go down out there? Do you think I could ask the folks who call themselves white to do that? To switch for a little while? How should I ask them if I could? Could I say, hi, white people. Come here, white people. Come on up here, if you're physically able to. Could I say, come up here, folks who identify as white. You know who you are. You can choose to come up here to where I've always been, where my family has always been. Sit on the couch, make yourself a plate, look out from where I am, and let me and my family go out to where you've always been. Could I say that? Could I ask them that? How should I ask? If I asked, would they do it? How long would it take? Would it help if I told them that the show is ending? Would it help white people to come up here to where I've been if I tell them that we'll all leave soon? That there are things in motion already. That we are all going to leave anyway. Could I tell them that those seats are not theirs, even though they paid for them? 
that no one can own a seat forever. That no one should. Could I say, see, there's Terry. She's our stage manager. She's amazing. She's white. She's coming up here too. You can come on up here too. Leave your coats, leave your bags, leave your things. Just stop worrying about your things for a minute and worry about where you can go. What you can do to make space for someone else for a minute if you could. Do I sound naive? Does that matter? Do I have to keep talking to them and keep talking to them and keep talking only to them, only to them, only to them until I've used up every word, until I have nothing left for you? I've been trying to talk to you this whole time. Have you heard me? Do I have to tell them that I want them to make space for us, for them to make space for that, us? Do I really have to tell them that? Do I have to tell them why I want them to go up there for them to go up there? Why I want them to sit on the sofa and sit on the chairs and sit on the carpet and touch the walls and touch the fake food and touch your own face pretending to look in a mirror but really looking into the lights. They're really bright, aren't they? Should I tell them that the lights are there to help people see them, not to help them see anything? So I can be out down here with all my people of color, with all my colorful people. And we can be all of us together alone. And if I were to go out down here with my colorful people, could I tell us a story? If I were out down here, just us, I'd want to tell us a story story about ending or about leaving or about remaining and how they're all the same thing if the same people do them. But that's not the story I want to tell us all. If I could tell the story I want to tell us, my people, my colorful people, you would hear it if I could tell it. It would be something like a story about us, by us, for us, only us. But that's not telling the story. If I could tell the story I want to tell, it would begin like this. Once upon a time, there was a bright little girl who knew that if she worked twice as hard as a white, no, that's not what I wanted to tell. Once there was a little boy born with the deck stacked against, no. Once there was an exceptional little, ah! It's difficult because I've already heard so many stories. It's hard to find the one I wanted to tell. It would be something like, once, not once, not all at once. Many, 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 many times, there was a person who works hard, a person who tried to work hard and tried to do their best and tried to do well by their family and tried to be good and tried to do better. Many, many times they tried this and so. <sighs> the person became who they always were, who we always are, a person trying. So they tried, and they tried, and they looked around at the mountains of effort that they had built with their try, at the piles of half-built best, at the heaps of family, at the hills of good enough hills and better next time. And as they looked around, as they took in the view, 
they saw what they had done to make the life that they had lived. And they looked to the left and saw what you had done to try to make the life that you had lived. And they took in that view. And they looked to the right and saw what you had done to try to make the life that you have lived. And they took in that view. On being brought from Africa to America by Phyllis Wheatley. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I, redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians? Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train. Them some flowers. I got them for you. Or oh, I got them from across the street. I wasn't going to buy them. <laughs> I think that's silly to buy flowers. <laughs> White folk do that. If I want to buy you something, I buy you earrings or something. But I got them, and I got them for you. I saw them, and I said, mm, I'm going to take these to Rissa. She a woman. Woman's supposed to like nice things. Flowers and lace and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you better look at those flowers and see where they got your name on them. I picked them four or five because I was thinking of you and I looked and seen where they had your name on it. <laughs> now you're talking about you don't want them? <laughs> Hell, a flower's a flower. <laughs> They're going to be dead in a minute if you don't put them in some water. They're going to be dead in two or three days even if you do. <laughs> Go on and put them in a glass and enjoy them. People throwing all that money away, buying flowers. <laughs> Ego Tripping, There May Be a Reason Why by Nikki Giovanni. I was born in the Congo. I walked to the Fertile Crescent and built the Sphinx. I designed a pyramid so tough that a star that only grows every 100 years falls into the center, giving divine, perfect light. I am bad. I sat on the throne drinking nectar with Allah. I got hot and sent an ice age to Europe to cool my thirst. My oldest daughter is Nefertiti. The tears from my birth pains created the Nile. I am a beautiful woman. I gazed on the forest and burned out the Sahara Desert with a packet of goat's meat and a change of clothes. I crossed it in two hours. I am a gazelle, so swift, so swift, you can't catch me. For a birthday present, when he was three, I gave my son Hannibal an elephant. He gave me Rome for Mother's Day. My strength flows ever on. My son Noah built new ark and I stood proudly at the helm as we sailed on a soft summer day. I turned myself into myself and was Jesus 
Men intone my loving name. All praises. All praises. I am the one who would save. I sold diamonds in my backyard. My bowels deliver uranium. The filings from my fingernails are some my precious jewels. On a trip north, I caught a cold and blew my nose, giving oil to the Arab world. I am so hip, even my errors are correct. I sailed west to reach east and had to round off the earth as I went. The hair from my head thinned and gold was laid across three continents. I am so perfect, so divine, so ethereal, so surreal. I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. I mean, I can fly like a bird in the sky. <laughs> I've been shooting heroin since your grandfather died. Now give me my works. Don't look at me like that. In fact, I'd prefer if you didn't look at me at all. Sweet Pea, I thought I'd get to this point and be filled with so much wisdom that I'd know just how to control the pain that's trailed me through life. The truth would be revealed and some great doorway would open and God's light would encircle me and lift me out of the ordinariness of my life. <laughs> oh, one would think you'd be closer to God in my age. But I find that I am curiously further away. Yes, Lord, I came here with nothing. Got my high school diploma, raised five beautiful children, worked two jobs. <laughs> and what do I get to look forward to each morning? A view of that brick building across the way and a perpetually gray life. For a few dollars, I get to leave this drab apartment. Who is hurt? And I'm going to die soon enough one way or the other. I'm old. I can't do it. Sharona, I, I ain't happy. At your age, I already had five children. I did for others for so long. Now, it's time to do for myself. Poem for Haruko by June Jordan. I never thought I'd keep a record of my pain or happiness like candles lighting the entire soft lace of the air around the full length of your hair, a shower organized by God in brown and auburn undulations luminous like particles of flame. But now I do retrieve an afternoon of apricots and water interspersed with cigarettes and sand and rocks we walked across. How easily you held my hand beside the low tide of the world. Now I do relive an evening of retreat, a bridge I left behind where all the solid heat of lust and tender trembling lay as cruel and as kind as passion spins its infinite tergiversation in between the bitter and the sweet. Alone and longing for you. Now I do.
You wouldn't understand this yet, son, but your daddy is going to make a transaction, a business transaction that's going to change our lives. That's all come one day when you're about 17 years old. I'll come home and I'll be pretty tired. You know what I mean. After a day of conferences and secretaries getting things all wrong the way they do. Because an executive's life is hell, man. <laughs> and I'll pull the car up on the driveway. Just a plain black Chrysler, I think. White walls. No, black tires. More elegant. Because rich people don't have to be flashy. <laughs> And I'll go up the steps to the house. And the gardener will be clipping away at the hedges. And he'll say, good evening, Mr. Younger. And I'll say, hello, Jefferson. How are you this evening? <laughs> and I'll go inside and Ruth will come downstairs and meet me at the door. We kiss each other and she takes me by the arm and we go up to your room to see you sitting on the floor with the catalogs of all the great schools of America around you. I, I, all the great schools of the world. And I say, all right, son, it's your 17th birthday. What is it you've decided? Just tell me where you want to go to school and you'll go. Just tell me what it is you want to be. Yes, sir. You just name it, son. And I hand you the world. I Am a Black Woman by Mari Evans. I am a black woman. The music of my song, some sweet arpeggio of tears is written in a minor key and I can be heard humming in the night, can be heard humming in the night. I saw my mate leap screaming to the sea and I with these hands cup the life breath from my issue in the cane break. I lost Nat's swinging body in a rain of tears and heard my son scream all the way from Anzio for peace he never knew. I learned the Nang and Pork Chop Hill in anguish. Now my nostrils know the gas, and these triggered, tired fingers seek the softness in my warrior's beard. I am a black woman, tall as a cypress, strong beyond all definition still defying place and time and circumstance, assailed, impervious, indestructible. Look on me and be renewed. You know why I'm not breaking my back as a practical nurse and Vi's not frying hair, except on the side? Because the work's too hard, the money ain't worth it, and there's not much room for advancement. You shamed us. <laughs> well, get slapped in the face with this. How shame you gonna be when you have to get out here and hustle yourself a job, any job? How shame you gonna be when you start getting raggedy and all them foxy girls are no longer impressed about how slick and smooth and pretty you look? Waiting? for the Harrisons to voluntarily donate their Christian charity is one sure way of landing head first in the dungeon poorhouse. <laughs> Who runs the Harrison house? 
from top to bottom. I cook the food, scrub the floors, open the doors, serve the table, answer the phones, just the furniture, raise the children, lay out the clothes, greet the guests, fix the drinks, and dump the garbage. All for this bad pay, as you say. You right. Money I get in my envelope ain't worth the headache and time. But God helps those who helps themselves. I also order the food, estimate the credit, pay the bills, and balance the budget. Which means before butcher calls cow, <laughs> I done reserved two for myself. Now, every once in a full moon, they get good hearted and tell me, take home some leftovers. But by that time, my freezer and pantry is already fuller than theirs. Every one of them high priced suits I lay on you haven't been worn more than once, and some of them not at all. When they moved from their old penthouse, we hired us a moving van to haul enough pieces to furnish our apartments and still had enough to ship a living room down to your mom. Mr. Harrison told us, don't let the stuff to charity. We did, us. And all our bills, I add to their bills. The deluxe plane takes your mom jet up here on every year. Weekly prescriptions filled on their tab. Tons of laundry cleaned along with theirs and thousands of other services I'm earning me quite a bonus along with my bad pay. After cutting cane and picking rice and shucking corn before we could braid our hair and pigtails, figure we just getting back what's owed to us. Maybe we did dishonor, dishonor Africa, embarrass the NAACP, are hopelessly behind time and scandalously outdated. We hardly worthy of your respect. But when I thought about that new top coat with the velvet trim collar I just packed to bring you, a couple of new cashmere sweaters, brand new slacks, a shiny new attache case for your appointments, and a scrumptious new collapsible pool, I promised your mom. Well, <laughs> Sorrow Home by Margaret Walker. My roots are deep in Southern life, deeper than John Brown or Nat Turner or Robert Lee. I was sired and weaned in a tropic world. The palm tree and banana leaf, mango and coconut, breadfruit and rubber trees know me. Warm skies and gulf blue streams are in my blood. I belong with the smell of fresh pine, with the trail of coon and the spring growth of wild onion. I am no hothouse bulb to be reared in steam heated flats with the music of L and Subway in my ears, walled in by steel and wood and brick far from the sky. I want the cotton fields tobacco and the cane. I want to walk along with sacks of seed to drop in fallow ground. Restless music is in my heart and I am eager to be gone. Oh, Southland, sorrow home, melody beating in my bone and blood. How long will the clan of hate, the hounds and the chain gangs keep me from my own? Death ain't nothing. I done seen them. I done wrestled them. You can't tell me nothing about death. Death, <laughs> death ain't nothing but a fastball on the outside corner. You know what I do to that. Now in my line, you get one of them fastballs by waist high, the outside corner of the plate, so you can get the meat of the bat right on it, and good God, you can kiss it goodbye. Now in my line. If I'm lying, that's 450 feet of line. I'm not talking about death. 
It's part of life. Everybody going to die. I'm going to die. You going to die. Bono going to die. We all going to die. Ain't that right, Bono? You know, I don't drink like this, but one night after week, that's Friday night, I drink just enough, and then I cut it loose. I leave it alone. So you ain't got to worry about me drinking myself to death because I ain't worried about death. I done seen them. I done wrestled them. Look at Bado. I looked up one day, death marching straight toward me. Like soldiers on a parade. Army and death marching straight towards me. It was July 1941. And it got cold as winter. And it seemed like death reached out and touched me on my shoulder the same way I touch you right now. I got cold. Death just stood there grinning at me. So finally I said, what you want with me, Mr. Death? You done sent your army to come get me? And I looked him dead in the eye. But I wasn't feeling nothing. I was ready to take. The way I'm ready to tangle right now, the Bible say be ever vigilant. I got to keep alert. So finally, Death, with his sickle in his hand, he say to me, you won't bound over another year. Just like that. You won't bound over another year. And I say, hell, we can settle this right now. So I grabbed that sickle and I threw it as far as I could throw it. And me and death, we commenced to wrestling for three days and three nights. And he seemed like just about every time he's about to do me in, I find the strength somewhere deep inside myself. And I do him one better. And we wrestle for three days and three nights. And I'm standing here to tell you about it. All right. So after we done wrestled for three days and three nights, we done we done weaken each other to where we can hardly move. Death stood up and he put on his white robe. He had one of those robes with a hood on it, and he went to go look for his sickle. And he said, "I'll be back," just like that. "I'll be back." <laughs> and I say, "You gonna have to come find me, cause I ain't no fool. I ain't going around looking for death." There ain't nothing to play with. And I know one day he's going to get me. I know one day he's going to make me part of his followers. Part of his band of army. But but as long as I got my strength. And as long as I keep up my visions. He's going to have to fight to come get me. Because I ain't going easy.